just in general, if you go into healthcare as a radiologist or an employee, you like helping patients. It's really gratifying to see that you've helped someone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. Today, we are joined by Claude Hooten, who I've just learned is Claude Hooten III, a litany of Claude's. Welcome to the show. Um, Claude has over 25 years of strategic, operational, and corporate management experience within high-growth healthcare tech companies. For the past nine years, Claude led StatRad, which is, includes developing and commercializing one of the first cloud-native packs and image exchange platforms, which was sold to Change Healthcare in 2020. Prior to joining the team, Claude managed the U.S. sales operations for Qualcomm, the healthcare division for Qualcomm, and he also served as the president of PMB Real Estate Services Division of Veritas REIT and as the EVP board member of Baxter Corporation, a global medical device company later acquired by Baxter International. He's held roles at Pyrxis, Dura Pharmaceuticals, and Eli Lilly. Claude holds a BS in finance from San Diego State University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Just a really broad ranging set of experiences in healthcare and technology. And, you know, most recently in our neck of the woods here in radiology. So super excited to have you on the show chatting all things radiology, all things technology. But first, I should say you and I have several things in common. You know, we both hold MBAs from Harvard and have, you know, experiences in big tech and startups. But most importantly, we both married women from Ohio. Yet somehow you convinced your wife to move with you to San Diego. And here I am moving to Cincinnati, Ohio in July. How did you pull that off? Well, I should also say my wife went to Harvard Dental School and completed two years of medical school at Harvard. So I really screwed up her whole career by having her come here. But I went to college here. Uh, and by the way, San Diego State, my alma mater, uh, if you know, made it to the, uh, the final championship. A great run. A great yeah. run. <laughs> that was great. I brought back a gift from Houston. Uh, I got my first COVID case, but I think it was worth it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not too hard of a sell when you come to San Diego, especially when, right around winter time. And uh, so I really wanted to live here. And that was something that kind of drove my strategy. If you remember graduating from business school, I could have gone to Microsoft. I could have gone to uh, Oracle. I was a tech guy. So I was in high demand in 1990. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't be working right now if I'd done any of those. But I really wanted to live in San Diego and gave my fiance at the time a chance to kind of check it out. And uh, she was going to transfer to a different medical school. Then we had our first daughter and kind of changed strategies. But, you know, it's just a wonderful place to live. And, and I'm really glad we did it. So you did it smarter than I did. I took Taylor to look at Miami for residencies in July which was a mistake because it was 105 degrees in Miami. Yeah. And she said, yeah, no chance. All joking aside, you know, you mentioned you're a tech guy and then you found your way into sort of a more narrow scope within the healthcare technology industry. Um, yeah. What led to that? Well, so I, when I got out of business school, I really wanted to live in San Diego. That was like one of my key things. Uh, I just loved the lifestyle here. I grew up along the coast of Southern Cal. And back then, 1990, uh, California was going through one of the worst recessions ever because of the defense spending cuts. And honestly, San Diego didn't have much going on. And so the only thing that was really kind of moving then was biotech and life sciences. So I thought, OK, I'm going to be a biotech guy. Um, I don't have a science degree. And so I entered in through the finance route, went to a company called Hybertech, which developed the first PSA test. And they were acquired by Eli Lilly. But that got me into the healthcare space, just kind of opportunistically, and then really found I had a passion for it. And I got out of biotech, and, and San Diego is one of the life science kind of meccas in the country, uh, one of the top three. But I, I don't have a science degree, and I kind of, and also you could spend ten years at a company, and then the product fails in clinical mm. trials or what have you, and, and you really don't control your destiny. So um, I went to um, an early stage company called Dura Pharmaceuticals, which was a spinoff actually of Hybertech. And we went from 60 million market cap to 2 billion over five years. It was very successful. And then I transitioned into a tech company of Pixis, which was uh, owned by Cardinal Health at the time. Wow. So partly uh, just location drove the choice, but now you've been you know, having a wild, long career in healthcare. So it sounds like you've enjoyed it quite a bit. 
you know, I'm curious is from a CEO's perspective, we have a lot of different types of folks on the show. We've had a lot of clinicians, as you'd imagine, researchers, not that many CEOs, I'd say on the technology side. So tell us a little bit about what that's like and what are some of the biggest challenges you faced in your various roles as CEO? Yeah, good question. I think a lot of it is technology is one thing. The other is healthcare. It doesn't move quickly. And part of it is because you can hurt someone, you know, you can help people, but you can also hurt people. But I was very fortunate. This company Pixis was the fourth fastest company in history to get to hundred million in revenue. And they basically decentralized the pharmacy onto the nursing floors. And it was one of these kind of killer apps where everyone loved it. We weren't FDA uh, managed, so it was a lot easier to move quickly there. And I was in the marketing department. We had the number one brand in all of healthcare. So I always took credit for it, but frankly, I had nothing to do with it. You know, and that, that's as we talk about this, I found consistent patterns in success. And so, uh, you know, the challenges are trying to get healthcare people to try something different. And then when you throw in, in certain companies I've been with their FDA cleared technologies, you're very constricted on what you can say, what the claims can be and so forth. But just like here, like trying to get health systems to move to the cloud was we were pioneers there and it was a battle. I mean, no one wanted to do it. Now everyone's doing it, but it was scary. You're taking things off premise, putting it into a public cloud with Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud or or those. And the truth is, it's actually more secure in that environment. But for these IT professionals, that was a foreign concept. And the strategies I found along the way that are fairly consistent is there's different stages of a commercialization cycle. And they're all different. And one of the best books I ever read was Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. So you hear the term, you know, building the beachhead. And a lot of people use that kind of colloquial term. But it started, I think, with that book. And it's really the concept of <clears throat> you have to get in and, and build the early adopters. You have to get the innovators. And what they're looking for is totally different than the people that are the, the kind of late majority of the market and early majority. So when you're developing your sales and marketing strategies, your commercialization and support and everything, you have to understand they're each different. And so a lot of startups, the first thing they do is go, let's go to Mass General and get them to use our system. <laughs> and then they spend all their money trying to get this big marquee account. And so Crossing the Chasm is about these companies that do really well, they get a lot of adoption, and then they kind of just die. And so what you have to realize is you're developing your strategy. And to me, marketing is strategy. That's one of the things people also don't understand is that being a marketing or product management professional is about the strategy of selling your product and getting it out there and not only selling it, supporting it, manufacturing and everything. But in any event, in healthcare and anywhere, you have to change your strategy as you're trying to get to that ramp, the growth phase of the bell curve. And that's the early majority and they want something different. And they require that you have reference accounts that are a little more significant in size. And so when you're starting out, you got to get the early adopters, get people who want technology. They're just on the bleeding edge. And then slowly you have to now migrate to your whole goal is getting reference accounts geographically spread out through the country. And then you may consider going to a mass general or one of the bigger you know names out there, Sloan Ketterings and so forth. But don't do it early on because you'll, you'll run out of money and it won't work. So it sounds like the area that you have brought the most experience into the CEO role is in that marketing and driving adoption and commercialization of these, call it novel healthcare technologies. So, yeah. so taking us to today, you, you joined StatRad almost a decade ago. Why did you do that? You know, at the time it was a teleradiology company. So not obviously a technology company, though it sounds like they had some, maybe some interesting tech you saw something there. What did you see? And, and tell us a little bit about how you- Well, it's kind of an interesting uh, story. It was around 2013, 14. I was at Qualcomm Life and their like healthcare division where they were doing uh, remote patient monitoring and enabling. It was a fabulous concept. I thought it was the future of healthcare and, and I was really excited about it. The problem was you just couldn't get people to adopt it. It was adding cost to the system. They didn't have the ability to kind of care coordinate and manage it. It'll hit eventually, but it was just going to take too long. Uh, it was kind of an interim role, and then it was really not where I wanted to be. And so there was an opportunity. It was in San Diego, the StatRad company. I'm like, uh, I don't want to work for a physician practice. That's not really my thing. But I sent the resume out. There was a LinkedIn thing. Had my first interview. Wasn't honestly all that interested. And then I talked to one of the gentlemen who 
so Statrad had just recently, about a few years prior, been bought out from a radiology group locally. They're very, very small. But one of the radiologists was this amazing, he's like the Elon Musk of healthcare. I joke with him. He's a, just a really good entrepreneur with a really good business sense and also an excellent radiologist. But he had a vision of building a tech company. So one of our core competencies was we built tech early on and we built our own packs and we knew that it was very nuanced and we wanted to do our own. And so he wanted to leverage that and, you know, go big. So after my first interview where I had no interest, we chatted, he and I, his name was Vish Verma, Dr. Vish Verma. And all of a sudden I got off the phone going, wow, this is like the perfect company, you know, for me. Because um, <laughs> uh, they had this core business that not only de-risks the strategy, but there's a tremendous amount of synergies that I can maybe talk about a little bit later that aren't obvious to almost everyone I talk to, but I saw it right away. You know, we had an established company. We had a really good brand in our space. And we were selling technology that leveraged that. And the people that would be buying it, would we would have street cred because we knew what we were doing because we we're already doing it on the teleradiology side. So it was very exciting. And then what happened with us was I came in and, you know, one of the challenges was how do we change the culture to being a tech and a services company without compromising the services, which we didn't. So we kind of separated it out. But the first thing I realized was we don't have a CTO and we're a tech company. So we started recruiting <laughs> and a gentleman who's kind of a key opinion leader in the space, uh, his name was Chris Hafey. He had been with a company called Stentor and they were bought by Philips because they had the fastest viewer. So he came in, he said, I'm really not interested because I'm starting my own company. And I've spent 10 years taking what we did at Stentor and we're and I've put it in JavaScript. So now it's a zero footprint HTML5 technology and it's as fast as on-premise viewers. And we already had a really fast viewer that we had developed. And so he pulls this thing up and he shows us a breast homo and it's like instantaneous and we're window leveling on this thing. I mean, we're blown away. So we said, no, come on in. We'll do our image because we were doing image sharing. Uh, that was our only strategy was that, not packs. And that kind of redirected us to even be more tech focused on developing a cloud pack solution that leveraged our image sharing kind of footprint to grow with that. And so... It was really an exciting run, but it's it's quite different going from a services company to image sharing, which is a lot less expensive to like full blown packs taking on GE and, <laughs> you know, slash change healthcare and Fuji and, you, you know, the names go on, but it was really an exciting thing to do. So were you running both the technology and the physician practice at the same time? Yeah. And so the way we did it, so Vish and I were really good friends and we still work really well together. So we kind of split the titles. He kept the CEO title. He really had a passion for the technology. So he really focused a lot on the development, the R&D part. I pretty much focused on running the rest of the companies, but we had a separate sales team focusing on tech. We had to build support for tech and the StatRad side. And so, yeah, I was kind of doing it all. And so I probably for about the first seven years, I never took a vacation. Like it's not healthy, but I live in San Diego, so it worked. Your um, life is a vacation. I, I, yeah. And I worked <laughs> almost every day, but it was, you know, people talk about that and it seems unhealthy, but on the other hand, I loved it. And I was made sure to give balance to my family, but it was really, you know, I was kind of found my passion and what I love doing. And so it was tough, but I, I'm now taking vacations again. <laughs> but, uh, you know, now, now we're uh, capacity constrained is really difficult. So the vacations aren't quite as enjoyable as I'd like, but so it was doing a lot. When we spun it off, our, my workload went down quite a bit. So it was kind of sure. it's still, it's normal now, but for a while it was crazy. So what you mentioned the book, Crossing the Chasm, what yeah. was getting that early adopter phase? Like who did you find some fit with? How did you find those customers? Why were they choosing it? Yeah, it's a great question. The beauty of what we had was to set up image exchange and to set up teleradiology is the same thing. So what we do is we put an edge server on. So that's a gateway to the internet. And what it does, it compresses and encrypts a study and sends it over. So our packs, what we have is a unified work list and we have one viewer. So our rads read for now 700 sites around the country but they have one workflow they're looking at. So for every site we go live with, we have to set up an edge server. We have to compress encrypt studies from their packs to go to our cloud. You know, We keep the studies in Microsoft Azure, but our system is in the data center. So our clients are radiology groups, but we serve as hospitals. 
So we went to the friendly hospitals and said, who wants to be, a, you know, an alpha site or a beta site? And a bunch of them volunteered. And the thing that I found working for a big company versus small, big companies are very risk averse. They don't want to go to market till everything's perfect. And it takes, you know, decades sometimes. We're like, let's go to market, tell the client what they're going to get. And then you do whatever it takes to make it work. And so that's what we did was they had my cell phone number, you know, I'm moving my kids into college and I get a call at 5 a.m. It's not working. I call the CTO, wake them up. You know, <laughs> on. And I remember his, he had been with big companies. He's like, hey, well, have you gone through the regular channels? I'm like, this is Bon Secure's health. Get on the phone right now. Figure this out. <laughs> we're not, we're not here, you know, we're not, we're doing it differently. <laughs> But anyway, we have that. And that was one of the things I saw very, you know, in my interviews, I was like, wow, you got this like base of clients that will work with you in the same space, doing essentially the same thing for image transmission. So that was the other thing is when we went to a health system, we could say, you know, we do this already. We're already in, you know, Scripps Health was our first client was Scripps here in town in 1996. And I could go through a litany of healthcare systems that we're working with. And so the IT guys were more comfortable with us because we're already doing it for the Telrad. Yeah, side. you already had reference clients. You already had a lot of the security hoops jumped through in terms of I've already hooked into their healthcare IT systems. So you've got a little bit of a land and expand beachhead. Yeah, my favorite story there I think about. So Mercy Health out of Ohio, at the time, I think they're about a 40 or 50 hospital health system. They were with an image sharing company that got bought out and then redirected on to do only clinical trials called Intelimage. And they they said, we got to go, you know, and they didn't want to do the hospital space anymore. So then they went out to bid. So we're competing against Life Image, Ombra, Nuance. They're all extremely well-capitalized companies. Ours, we put very little into developing our image exchange. And so we, we ended up getting the contract. But as we're talking, the other firms are talking about setting up a pilot and, you know, it's going to take three months. And I... Uh, I said, let's do a pilot. We can get it going tomorrow. And so that we get this call with like 30 people from around the health system, you know, it's, it's <laughs> a humongous thing. And I said, you know, we're in four year hospitals right now. And they said, no, no, you're not. I've looked again. We changed our name to Nucleus Health. That's a funny story how we did that. But um, <laughs> they said, we're searching under Nucleus and, uh, you know, it's nowhere. And I go, well, type in StatRad. And they go, oh, yeah, you're in four of our hospitals and two, two <laughs> rad groups, four hospitals. And I go, we can get those images. We actually have the images right now. So we can start going right now, like today. <laughs> and, and so, it, I mean, no one could say that. And that was really powerful. It was really a funny moment. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about the state of image exchange, because, you know, you mentioned some other big players, Life Image, Ombra, Ombra sold to Intellirad. I believe Life Image also got acquired. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, they did. Yep. Also by Intellirad or was it someone else that? Yeah, Intellirad as well. Yeah, they're rolling. So, rolling. so I guess Intellirad's the 800 pound gorilla now, or are there yeah. other big and then, players? And want power share. I don't know how much they're supporting it, but you know, the thing about image exchange, it's really frustrating because it is an exceptionally powerful tool. So when we were working with Mercy Health, they rolled it out better than pretty much anyone. And our number two largest account was Bon Secours Mercy Health. Bon Secours, they merged. So we had like this, you know, humongous client all of a sudden. So in 2018, Microsoft gives an award um, at HIMSS every year for the best innovation in clinical care. It's a global award. And so there were three companies that got awards in three different categories. One was a company out of Australia. That wasn't IMED. It was a health system of some sort. Someone mm -hmm. else and us, we won with Mercy Health because of what we we're doing there. And to give you an idea, so... In their stroke care, they had put CT scanners in ambulances, and then they had our image exchange. So in transit, they would send a scan to the stroke team. They get a secure text message, log in, look at the study on our clinical class two viewer, and make a you know a quick diagnosis so they can begin treating people in transit. And you know, there's just all sorts of other use cases that people don't think about surgical planning for robotics companies need to get images. They have hundreds of people driving around picking up CDs so the surgeon can plan and order the parts for the surgery and things like that. I mean, it's crazy that we're still getting CDs. <laughs> so I think it's just changing workflows is really hard. But I mean, I've gone into Simon Med, for example. I know they use uh, Nuance because we were working with them in the deal to get the deal and we ended up not getting it. 
So I went in for some imaging work and they give me a CD. I go, no, I'd like to have it. And they were actually using our technology as well. So I said, I'd like you guys to send it to me. And they're like, no, we don't do that. And I said, I know you do. So I call up Change Healthcare. I get our guy that used to work here. I go, well, who's the guy at the place? And he gives me the name and I call him back and I go, hey, this guy uses our stuff in your office. Can you send it to me? So <laughs> you know, I finally ended up getting it. But, you know, there's tricky in that way. But I think to me, it's so powerful. You know, as a patient, when I was using it, my wife had a back issue. We go and we're talking to the ortho surgeon. He pulls up the images on his laptop, his little wheel is spinning. And I go, oh, you're trying to go look at L5. I, I take my phone, I log into her account. I zoom in on it. I show him and he goes, this is what you're trying to show her. And he goes, yeah, this is it. And I go, you, want to <laughs> you know, I type in his email address, hit send. He gets it. It's incredibly powerful and works and it's secure. It's crazy that it's not more widely adopted, but you're now dealing with people in the file room and other places. Um, hold on just one second. Thank goodness this isn't live. <laughs> oh, no, so, you're good. I'm going to bring the audience behind the curtain here. So okay. for the audience, in case this was jumpy, Claude just got pulled into an FDA meeting because part of the joys of running a company that builds a PAX product is they are FDA certified class two medical device. So he just got pulled in quickly and he's back. But you know, you were talking a little bit about the value of image exchange and the crazy state that we find ourselves in where you could still go to you know, an imaging center in the US and, and leave without your digital files. And it's funny because this, you know, we've been talking about this now for 10 years, but as you mentioned, change takes time and there's so many workflows that need to be completely rethought and so many risk averse stakeholders that, you know, you just kind of wait for, you know, some people are just going to wait until GE does it for them because I've already got the GE equipment and the GE packs and you know, Although, innovation. you know, what we found is the PAX companies don't get it. I mean, even Change Healthcare, when they were buying our technology, I don't think they realized how powerful our image exchange was. They were mainly focusing on the PAX side of things. And I would tell them every time we'd talk and, you know, we had over 9,000 clients using it and we had set it up to be kind of a global ecosystem. So we weren't making a bunch of money on it. Um, and that's part of the challenge is that People don't want to pay a lot for it, but it's an extremely powerful tool. So the, the bigger companies, as you know, Daniel, working for Google and I work for Qualcomm, they have a real struggle with innovation. And you would think they'd be the most innovative companies, but they're not. <laughs> it's the little nimble companies. And so the PAX companies are struggling because PAX really didn't get a lot of investment. All the money and all the talent went into EMRs with the High Tech Act. So a lot of the PAX technology is old and the cultures and the organizations are back in the slinging iron days of big on-premise solutions. And so you're giving up a revenue base to move into that. Image exchange doesn't make you a lot of money. It's just a very that's powerful, needed tool out there. So that's that's why- Why is I, that? Is it just because, you know, what are they willing to pay for these we services? We charge very little. You know, it was a couple million in revenue, I think, after we've been doing it. Our strategy was we were going to go in with image sharing. It's a much easier transition to get into a, an, an organization. Mm. We would then you know, migrate. And, and it kind of like when the Telerad, when I could say, hey, you want to use image exchange? We'll just go turn it on. Same thing with PAX. And that's the power of a cloud native solution, multi-tenant, infinitely scalable. You don't have to manage the data center. You don't have to have a big IT staff. It's a SaaS model. Like we had a big ER center in Cape Cod. It was one of the busiest ERs on the East Coast in the summer. In the winter, it's like nothing going on there. Uh, <laughs> so they had difficulty getting rads to move there. So they had radiologists reading remotely and they were using one of the big name packs and it was really slow, had a lot of latency and they wanted to test ours out. And so they're like, hey, you know, we'd like to try it out. You know, what is it going to take to do it? And I said, hey, hold on a second. Hey, Elizabeth, hit, click the button for PAX. Okay, you're ready to go. I mean, it was that simple. <laughs> you know, like we had the images. They just have to now launch a different viewer. It was the diagnostic viewer with the uh, hanging protocols and NPR and all the other stuff radiologists require. But that was how we could do that. So it's a lot easier to go up from the PAX, from the image exchange side, because it's more of a newer technology. It's more cloud focused. Uh, I mean, Ombra is really heavily into the cloud and Life Image had kind of the early 
innovators dilemma you know they were the first ones to market they spent a hundred million dollars kind of getting the market going and then they kind of had to throw in the towel and i think that's i don't know the details on it but i mean they were in 2009 i think is when they were getting going so the market was still very early then for the cloud yeah so you mentioned changed healthcare a few times so tell us a little bit about the state of the company you sold part of the company uh in 2020 and yeah. but you retained some of it so kind of give us the high level overview yeah. So when I came to the company, it was very closely held, majority owned by a few radiologists and a couple of business people. And I'm now one of the owners. And so when I came in, we were burning quite a bit of cash. So I went out and raised private equity and they weren't majority owners. That was very important to us. So we maintained majority ownership. That's another critical thing, I think, depending on your situation, they usually want to have majority ownership. And I think if that had happened, we would have made some really bad strategic moves along the way. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they were very smart, very competent people, but they weren't in the weeds like I was and like the rest of our company was. So it's challenging. You can't have a board run your company. We need to run the company. And so it was a really good relationship. I'm still good friends with them. But when we when we were selling the tech, it wasn't a home run, but it was a pretty good valuation. It was too early. We were just starting to commercialize. We had seven packs contracts we just signed. All of them image exchange clients, they already knew us. They trusted us. They were smaller. They knew they were taking some risk, but they, we gave them incentives. So anyway, change came in and made it. They were going to license our viewer because we pretty much had the fastest zero footprint viewer in the world. And then they said, you know, we've looked at this and we're going cloud. And they were one of the first big companies, to, market leaders to say, we're going with a cloud native strategy as our core strategy, not as like an ancillary strategy. Mm. And we like that. They had already done a cloud VNA and launched it the year before. And so uh, they got it. And so when we looked at who was going to take this, our baby and make it successful, they seemed like the best. The woman leading it, uh, Tracy, is a really solid leader. She leads their imaging division. So they came in and bought it. Uh, they made an offer that, that worked. And then I kind of went to some of the two of the other owners and said, you know, let's try to see if we can do a management buyout and kind of get the private equity guys out because they're not really adding any value. And they they really didn't want to invest in a service company. They're, they were more interested in a tech company. So mm -hmm. that's a whole nother podcast. What it was, I mean, about 50 things had to work for us to pull that off and all 50 worked, which they never do. <laughs> and uh, there's all sorts of stories in there that you won't even believe. But we bought out all of our option holders. Bonskers Mercy Health actually became an investor. So we bought out their shares, you know, all of our board members, the whole nine yards. And now it's a very closely held organization, which is amazing because now we can be extremely nimble. And we, if I want to do something for a customer that's not in the contract or whatever, I just do it. And there's no one to, to deal with. Um, I, I, <laughs> I laugh because I, I still think the funniest story is my first board meeting after this. You know, our board meetings used to be traditional board meetings or high pressure, high intensity, all day things. You know, there's always some kind of confrontation going on. And then like the next board meeting, I'm talking to Vish on the phone and I'm presenting basically to myself because I still run it like <laughs> a professional PE back company. We still have board packages and everything. And he's kind of breathing hard. I'm like, are you okay? Like, what do you, what? he's like, oh, I'm on the treadmill. <laughs> so literally like, you know, we go from like a board of, you know, whole day meeting to where like we're having, and he's getting his workout in while I'm uh, reading to myself. So. Uh, but no, we it works really well and it's very effective and we're really focused on taking care of our clients and our radiologists and our employees. And so now the company's is what? It's the teleradiology practice and some core technology as well? Yeah. So our core technology, that was one of our competitive advantages early on was that we we knew that what was being presented out there wasn't going to work. Nighthawk teleradiology is very nuanced. We have a 20, 30, that's like 40 coordinators at night that support our radiologists. We have a whole separate app for them that's integrated with our PACs so that they prepare the studies, they get the relevant priors, they get the histories, things like that. They make sure all the images have come in before a radiologist starts reading. That doesn't happen in a radiology practice. So there's all these things that are very nuanced. So we developed that and we still do that. So we're even the technology we developed that we sold to change we weren't using. That was really developed for third-party use. We use the viewer part now for, uh, for some of our ads, but not in the workflow. That's our own proprietary system. Really interesting. 40 staff coordinators to prepare for 
for the radiologist night reads is, uh, I think you said you had around 90 radiologists. That's some heavy service for the radiologist. I imagine that might be one of the reasons they like working at StatRad. You know, it's obviously a very challenging recruiting market. You guys have remained very competitive. How have you done that? You know, I think one of the things is we're very selective. We interviewed about 580 people or so last year. We hired 26 rads. It was a record year for us, actually. And one, our coordinators are, I mean, every time I talk to any of our rads, they love our coordinators because we really have a unique team that are very customer oriented, uh, not only for our clients, but for the radiologists. You know, when we get a positive finding, they get the client on the line. So the radiologist has a, a doctor to doctor communication with no lag in there. If the radiologist sees something they need, the cords go get it. So that's really important. It's interesting because there was a proprietary study done by a company that showed me the data and they interviewed about 350 Nighthawk teleradiologists. They kind of said, what are the most important things to you? And there's, you know, litany of things, but the top four things were compensation, workflow, flexibility, and strong technology. And then they mm. ranked about 20 of our competitors. And we were number one in two out of the four and very close behind VRAD on technology and workflow. And, and VRADs like us, they developed their own technology and that's one of their core advantages as well. And they went big out the gate. And so, but yeah. they, they're the number one competitor, even though RAD Partners is also a client. So we work closely with them. Really interesting. So any advice that you have for leaders interested in this space, people that want to work in radiology, maybe people who aren't radiologists, but find the field, you know, endlessly interesting. Yeah. I think like anything, Daniel, it's like finding a fit for what you want, you know, for our employees, like, you know, one of the things we do here is we run it like a business. And I think a lot of people think that has a negative stigma or connotation, but I don't think it does, you know, so there's things that are very complex, like technology and customer support and all these things that we're trained as business people to do. And so when we hire the business people, they're not treated any differently than a radiologist, like we're all equal. So I make sure that our radiologists know that everyone knows the rads are really important, but everyone here is treated with dignity. Everyone here is viewed as equally important. And so I think that makes it a really fun place to work. Also, just in general, if you go into healthcare as a radiologist or an employee, you like helping patients and you like, it's really gratifying to see that you've helped someone. And so that's important. Um, I think for a radiologist, I, when I talk to radiologists, Nighthawk radiology, teleradiology is a unique bird. I mean, we're, it's a high intensity kind of adrenaline rush thing going on every night. And so if you like that and you're fast and so you know, you have to be a very productive radiologist to be successful in this. So when I'm talking to people and I kind of say, you know, if you're below 50th percentile in reading speeds, you're still a great radiologist. You may not be a fit for our company. If you're in the top 10 to 20th percentile and you have a gift, this is the place for you because you're going to make a lot more money here. I mean, we have uh, many people making over a million dollars a year. They're really gifted in their speed and accuracy. And it's a lot of stuff that's not clinical. Like our one of our fastest readers, he's a gamer. He grew up as a gamer, you know, so he's got like these mice. <laughs> it has nothing to do with what he learned in med school. So he's just very efficient with technology. And so if you like, uh, you know, high intensity, high speed, high variability, and you're fast, this is a great environment. And if you want to work remotely or you want to have more flexibility for hours with your family and things like that, that's where this tends to be a fit. If you want to go into work, 40 hours a week and kind of have a, a little more stable, slow pace, then this may not be a fit. Yeah. Claude, I really enjoyed chatting with you. I learned a lot about both the technology and the practice of radiology. I really appreciate it. And good luck to you and the StatRad team. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Daniel. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiologyreportpodcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.